20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by Jules Verne. Part 1. Chapter 16. The Submarine Forest. We had at last arrived on the borders of this forest. Doubtless one of the finest of Captain Natmo's immense domains. He looked upon it as his own, and considered he had the same right over it that the first man had in the first days of the world. And, indeed, who would have disputed with him the possession of this submarine property? What other hardier pioneer would come, hatchet in hand, to cut down the dark copses? This forest was composed of large tree plants, and the moment we penetrated under its vast arcades, I was struck by the singular position of their branches a position I had not yet observed. Not an herb which carpeted the ground, not a branch which clothed the trees, was either broken or bent, nor did they extend horizontally all stretched up to the surface of the ocean. Not a filament, not a ribbon, however thin they might be, but kept as straight as a rock of iron. The fusi and lianas grew in rigid perpendicular lines, due to the density of the element which had produced them. Motionless yet, when bent to one side by the hand, they directly resumed their former position. Truly it was the region of perpendicularity. I soon accustomed myself to this fantastic position, as well as to the comparative darkness which surrounded us. The soil of the forest seemed covered with sharp blocks, difficult to avoid, the submarine flora struck me as being very perfect, and richer even than it would have been in the Arctic or tropical zones, where these productions are not so plentiful. But for some minutes I involuntarily confounded the genera, taking animals for plants, and who would not have been mistaken. The fauna and the flora are too closely allied in this submarine world. These plants are self-propagated, and the principle of their existence is in the water, which upholds and nourishes them. The greater number, instead of leaves, shoot forth blades of capricious shapes, comprised within a scale of colors pink, carmine, green, olive, fawn, and brown. Curious anomaly, fantastic element, said an ingenious naturalist, in which the animal kingdom blossoms, and the vegetable does not. In about an hour Captain Natmo gave the signal to halt. I, for my part, was not sorry and we stretched ourselves under an arbor of Valerie E., the long thin blades of which stood up like arrows. This short rest seemed delicious to me. There was nothing wanting but the charm of conversation, but, impossible to speak, impossible to answer, I only put my great copper head to conciles. I saw the worthy fellow's eyes glistening with delight, and, to show his satisfaction, he shook himself in his breastplate of air, in the most comical way in the world. After four hours of this walking, I was surprised not to find myself dreadfully hungry. How to account for this state of the stomach I could not tell, but instead I felt an insurmountable desire to sleep, which happens to all diverse, and my eyes soon closed behind the thick glasses, 
and I fell into a heavy slumber, which the movement alone had prevented before. Captain Natmo and his robust companion, stretched in the clear crystal, set us the example. How long I remained buried in this drowsiness I cannot judge, but, when I woke, the sun seemed sinking towards the horizon. Captain Natmo had already risen, and I was beginning to stretch my limbs when an unexpected apparition brought me briskly to my feet. A few steps off, a monstrous sea spider, about thirty-eight inches high, was watching me with squinting eyes, ready to spring upon me. Though my diver's dress was thick enough to defend me from the bite of this animal, I could not help shuddering with horror. Concile and the sailor of the Nautilus awoke at this moment. Captain Nemo pointed out the hideous crustacean, which a blow from the butt end of the gun knocked over, and I saw the horrible claws of a monster right in terrible convulsions. This incident reminded me that other animals more to be feared might haunt these obscure depths against whose attacks my diving dress would not protect me. I had never thought of it before, but I now resolved to be upon my guard. Indeed, I thought that this halt would mark the termination of our walk, but I was mistaken, for, instead of returning to the Nautilus, Captain Nemo continued his bold excursion. The ground was still on the incline. Its declivity seemed to be getting greater, and to be leading us to greater depths. It must have been about three o'clock when we reached a narrow valley, between high perpendicular walls, situated about seventy-five fathoms deep. Thanks to the perfection of our apparatus, we were forty-five fathoms below the limit which nature seems to have imposed on man as to his submarine excursions. I say seventy-five fathoms, though I had no instrument by which to judge the distance. But I knew that even in the clearest waters the solar rays could not penetrate further and accordingly the darkness deepened. At ten paces not an object was visible. I was groping my way, when I suddenly saw the brilliant white light. Captain Natmo had just put his electric apparatus into use. His companion did the same, and Concile and I followed their example. By turning the screw I established a communication between a wire and the spiral glass, and the sea, lit by our four lanterns, was illuminated for a circle of thirty-six yards. As we walked I thought the light of our rum caught refect apparatus could not fail to draw some inhabitant from its dark couch. But if they did approach us, they at least kept at a respectful distance from the hunters. Several times I saw Captain Natmo stop, put his gun to his shoulder, and after some moments drop it and walk on. At last, after about four hours, this marvelous excursion came to an end. The wall of superb rocks in an imposing mass, rose before us, the heap of gigantic blocks, an enormous, steep granite short, forming dark grottoes, but which presented no practicable slope. It was the prop of the island of Crespo. It was the earth. Captain Nemo stopped suddenly. 
the gesture of his brought us all to a halt. And, however desirous I might be to scale the wall, I was obliged to stop. Here ended Captain Natmo's domains, and he would not go beyond them. Further on was a portion of the globe he might not trample upon. The return began. Captain Natmo had returned to the head of his little band, directing their course without hesitation. I thought we were not following the same road to return to the Nautilus. The new road was very steep, and consequently very painful. We approached the surface of the sea rapidly. But this return to the upper strata was not so sudden as to cause relief from the pressure to rapidly which might have produced serious disorder in our organization, and brought on internal lesions, so fatal to divers. Very soon light reappeared and grew, and, the sun being low on the horizon, the refraction edge the different objects with a spectral ring. At ten yards and half deep, we walked amidst a shoal of little fishes of all kinds, more numerous than the birds of the air, and also more agile, but no aquatic game worthy of a shot had as yet met our gaze, when at that moment I saw the captain shoulder his gun quickly, and follow a moving object into the shrubs. He fired. I heard a slight hissing, and a creature fell stunned at some distance from us. It was a magnificent sea otter, an anhydrous, the only exclusively marine quadruped. This otter was five feet long, and must have been very valuable. Its skin, chestnut brown above and silvery underneath, would have made one of those beautiful furs so sought after in the Russian and Chinese markets. The fineness and the luster of its coat would certainly fetch L-80. I admired this curious mammal, with its rounded head ornamented with short ears, its round eyes, and white whiskers like those of a cat, with webbed feet and nails and tufted tail. This precious animal, hunted and tracked by fishermen, has now become very rare, and taken refuge chiefly in the northern parts of the Pacific, or probably its race would soon become extinct. Captain Nemo's companion took the beast, threw it over his shoulder, and we continued our journey. For one hour a plain of Santalate stretched before us. Sometimes it rose to within two yards and some inches of the surface of the water. I then saw our image clearly reflected, drawn inversely, and above us appeared an identical group reflecting our movements and our actions, in a word like us in every point, except that they walked with their heads downward and their feet in the air. Another effect I noticed, which was the passage of thick clouds which formed and vanished rapidly, but on reflection I understood that these seeming clouds were due to the varying thickness of the reeds at the bottom and I could even see the fleecy foam which their broken tops multiplied on the water, and the shadows of large birds passing above our heads, whose rapid flight I could discern on the surface of the sea. On this occasion I was witness to one of the finest gun shots which ever made the nerves of a hunter thrill. A large bird of great breadth of wing, clearly visible, approached, 
hovering over us. Captain Nemo's companion shouldered his gun and fired, when it was only a few yards above the waves. The creature fell stunned, and the force of its fall brought it within the reach of dexterous hunter's grasp. It was an albatross of the finest kind. Our march had not been interrupted by this incident. For two hours we followed these sandy plains, then fields of algae very disagreeable to cross. Candidly, I could do no more when I saw a glimmer of light, which, for a half mile, broke the darkness of the waters. It was the lantern of the Nautilus. Before twenty minutes were over we should be on board, and I should be able to breathe with ease, for it seemed that my reservoir supplied air very deficient in oxygen. But I did not reckon on an accidental meeting which delayed our arrival for some time. I had remained some steps behind when I presently saw Captain Natmo coming hurriedly towards me. With his strong hand he bent me to the ground, his companion doing the same to concile. At first I knew not what to think of this sudden attack, but I was soon reassured by seeing the captain lie down beside me, and remain immovable. I was stretched on the ground, just under the shelter of a bush of algae, when, raising my head, I saw some enormous mass, casting phosphorescent gleams, pass blusteringly by. My blood froze in my veins as I recognized two formidable sharks which threatened us. It was a couple of tintorias terrible creatures, with enormous tails and a dull glassy stare, the phosphorescent matter ejected from holes pierced around the muzzle. Monstrous brutes, which would crush a whole man in their iron jaws. I did not know whether Concile stopped to classify them. For my part, I noticed their silver bellies and their huge mouths bristling with teeth, from a very unscientific point of view, and more as a possible victim than as a naturalist. Happily the voracious creatures do not see well. They passed without seeing us, brushing us with their brownish fins, and we escaped by a miracle from a danger certainly greater than meeting the tiger full face in the forest. Half an hour after, guided by the electric light we reached the Nautilus. The outside door had been left open, and Captain Natmo closed it as soon as we had entered the first cell. He then pressed a knob. I heard the pumps working in the midst of the vessel. I felt the water sinking from around me, and in a few moments the cell was entirely empty. The inside door then opened, and we entered the vestry. There our diving dress was taken off, not without some trouble, and, fairly worn out from want of food and sleep, I returned to my room, in great wonder at this surprising excursion at the bottom of the sea.